Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Everett. We are glad that you are joining with us both for those who are here in the sanctuary as well as those who are joining us virtually online. We are grateful that you are all here with us. And happy Father's Day to all the men and uh, those in our lives who have cared for us as fathers. We are grateful for you and we celebrate you today. Our flowers today are given by Rosemary in honor of her granddaughter. And granddaughters actually both graduating, and so we're grateful for those wonderful flowers today. I hope you stay and or I hope that you join us, excuse me, at 11.30 a.m. for coffee time followed by Bible study. The Zoom link is in your bulletin. Uh, next Sunday, we will begin having, we will be having worship at 10 a.m. both and hybrid, both in person as well as online. So we hope you are able to join us for that. Um, I'm going to be on vacation beginning uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, uh, for a couple weeks. So uh, lunch with Pastor Allen resumes uh, Tuesday, July 6th, and the Thursday Bible study is going to be off for the next couple weeks, and we will pick that up on Thursday, July 8th. Next Sunday, we're going to have our friend and fellow pastor, Bob Nicholson, uh, leading in worship. And there's a little blurb in the bulletin about some of the things that he's aiming to do. So please read the scriptures that he's provided and pray uh, for worship to, uh, next week. I know he appreciates that as he prepares. The following Sunday on July 4th, we're having Chris Hoke, our friend and director of Underground Ministries, will be preaching and leading in worship on the 4th of July. There's a gardening cleanup this Saturday, June 26th. If you have questions, begins at 9 here. If you have questions, please contact David Bear Peckham. And again, we congratulate our graduates of 2021. We know that uh, Everett, Jackson, and Cascade graduated yesterday from Memorial Stadium, had their official commencements. And so we continue to thank uh, and celebrate our graduates. And we honor your commitment and pray that God blesses you on your new journey. Now as we are gathered, let us stand and do our and, and participate in our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he shatters the door of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured infliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. He raises up the needy out of distress and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad and all wickedness stops in its mouth. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord.
As we, before we begin in prayer, we just want to remind, I just want to remind everyone to keep praying for Florence and Bev's family. We lift up Lucille Hofer as well. Uh, some new prayer requests that have come in. We uh, pray for Robin Kohler's stepmom, Mary Lee, who had uh, her leg amputated this past week. And an update this morning from Ari is that she came through the surgery, but she does have a long road of recovery and rehab ahead of her. Sandra Santos, one of our staff members, asked for prayers for her uncle, Jimmy, who was recently diagnosed, uh, I'm not going to, tr- glioblastoma, I'm sure, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and uh, her brother-in-law, John, uh, her husband, Sig, Sig's brother, was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer last week. Actually, not, it's not, it's her sister's husband, excuse me. Uh, Lois Teisling, she covets our prayers, and we pray for your sister, Linda Lois. And also, Marsha Luth just recently has been having some uh, significant health concerns, and so we lift her up as we pray as well. Now, Vicki and I watched this show called Alone, and it's a survival show. Um, and so it might be on a different season. We only watch it on Netflix when, it, when it's on Netflix because we don't have regular TV. Uh, but right now, the season we're in, they're in the Arctic, these survivalists, they're all by themselves. They have to film themselves, they have to survive them with themselves, and they're there to try to spend 100 days all alone. Now, each episode, one contestant usually has to pick up their satellite phone and call in uh, because they drop out for some reason. Uh, any, and now, each contestant also starts by saying they will never go home until they're the last one standing. They have all this confidence and these skills. And I'm, I mean, I'm always impressed, but there's usually one small mistake, and it cascades. You know, you, you, they lose their steel and their flint to make fires, which is, you need fire out in the Arctic. You cut your hand on your knife when you're not paying attention. That can be, you know, get infected, it really hurts. Letting the sparks go on your fire without paying attention to them, and all of a sudden your shelter might burn down. Not protecting your cache of food, and another animal gets it. I mean, these, these seemingly small things cascade into larger issues and the contestants make the agonizing decision to tap out. And now, of course, when, whenever they leave the show, there, there are tears and concerns. And in those moments, I actually want to reach out into the television and give them a hug to say, it's okay, you're not a failure. I would never do that in the Arctic by myself. You're not letting your family down. This experience, while these small mistakes might have hurt you in in your quest, 
They're not going to define you for the rest of your lives. You are more important. And, and you know, you, you need companionship. You need the other things to live. So don't let this affect the rest of your life. I mean, we get that. We want to say that for ourselves. We want to believe it for ourselves. But don't we beat ourselves up for no reason over small mistakes? That one mistake, that one gaffe, that foul world, word that came out of our mouths, that one event that we keep on going back to, we, wanna, we are more than those. We are more than those little mistakes or those little sins. And still, sometimes they nag at us and they eat away at us from the inside. Today in our prayers, I hope as we pray that we can stop beating ourselves up over one mistake or even the sin that might be really large in our lives because we are forgiven. We believe in a God who forgives us out of his rich rich mercy and as the psalm said, steadfast love. So let us pray. Lord, there are days when that one small mistake that slip, that burst of frustration gets the best of us. Heck, maybe no one else knows or even cares, but it gnaws at us. It can take us on a mental journey that totally throws us off all day long, or it can derail us when we're feeling really good, or it can just follow us like a dark cloud days on end. In our minds, we know that we are more. We are worth more than the sin which blocks us. We are capable of love and able to receive love, but we buy into lies, these lies that point out all of our faults all the time, lies that say that this sin will keep you away from us, lies that say we're not worthy of having love from our family and our friends. You know us and you love us, Lord. In your eyes, we are your children, even when we are off your path. You have given us life. You've given us love. You have given us breath. You've also called us to confess, to acknowledge our sin, those mistakes, to turn them over to you. We desire to be honest in our repentance, but you do not need us to wallow in pity. You forgive us and remove our sin as far as the east is from the west, you have redeemed us, not by our earning, but through your grace and mercy. So Lord, hear us now in this moment. Hear our concerns and our frustrations, the prayers on our hearts. Be patient with us and allow us to confess our sin. We praise you that in this moment you are hearing us that you are faithful and true to your word of grace. Let us take a moment in silence. trusting in your abundant hope and the hope we have in the resurrection, we dare to approach the throne of grace as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
your pardon, purity. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go in against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defiled the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I am not used to them. So David removed them. He took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in his pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come with me? With sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistines' army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When Goliath drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. When Saul saw David go out, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. The king said, inquire whose son the stripling is. On David's return from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Today is Father's Day. To my father, who usually watches our service later today, happy Father's Day, Dad. To the men and women in my life who have built me up and instructed me on how to be a man, thank you, and happy Father's Day. To the men who are fathers, thank you for being in worship before you go out golfing. And to all of us who are not biological fathers but have tried our best to care for children and youth in our lives, you too, happy Father's Day. There comes this point in every child's life when they try on their father's shoes. Some of us have funny baby pictures with our tiny feet in golf and loafers. Others put on our father's shoes and shuffle around the house as we add to laughter in the family. This begins a natural process of us testing out the theories and practices of life that our parents portray. Effectively, we put on the shoes of our fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, the cousins we look to, up to, and we try walking a little bit in their shoes as we navigate life. Now, this could lead to us having a particular sweet tooth for hot fudge rather than chocolate sauce pawned off as fudge. Or it could mean as much as I've tried, as much as I have really tried, I do not like corn pone, which is a favorite meal of our family. I do not follow those shoes. And it also factors into my decision to make cinnamon rolls like my grandmother time and time again, even, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that you can put frosting on any cinnamon hockey puck and still eat it. I've yet yet to get it to my grandmother's. I'm trying to follow in your shoes, Grandma, but not quite there. Indeed, other people's shoes are hard to fill, yet we are always walking a mile in another person's shoes as we navigate life using paths of support we've learned from others while adding our own steps to it and even passing some of our own shoe prints off for others to follow. As I thought about shoes this week, or at least following people's footsteps, I reflected on some times when I stumbled around and I needed the footsteps of others to guide me. Our neighbors across the street where we grew up Uh, had two girls the same age as Paul and me. They had a younger brother as well. We played all the time. One day, we got in trouble. All five of us got in trouble. And we were a little nervous. And we were given, we weren't punished, we were given chores to complete. Ingenious, I thought, actually at the time. I was given the task to sweep the back porch. And I remember looking directly at Mrs. Cannon and I said, I do not know how to sweep, so I will go home. (laughs) Yeah, right. Mrs. Cannon did not blink an eye. My parents, if you're watching this, you're probably rolling your eyes. But she said, here, let me show you, and you will never forget how to sweep correctly. She held the broom, and she did some strokes, and she handed it to me and said, now it's your turn. I'll be back to check on you when you're done. I think of her every time I pick up a broom. I love my second grade Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Peterson. I've talked about her before. She was one of those teachers who never raised her voice. She encouraged every student in her class. She encouraged all of those, even those who didn't memorize the verses for the week, unlike some of us who did. And she was a beacon of faith to me. 
I distinctly remember being so loved and cared for in her class that I hold her up as one of those saints of the faith who blessed me on the path that I continue to follow in. And whenever I lead a Sunday school class, there's this thought in the back of my mind that says, how would Miss Peterson do it? I think about my dad. My dad would drive Paul and I to Christmas pageant rehearsal in our old Mobile 88, our old 88. It had a front bench row seat. It had one of those, it didn't have bucket seats. It had a front row bench. And the three of us would be belted in driver, middle, window. And we would listen to the cassette tape of John Denver and the Muppets, which is the undisputed best Christmas album ever. Undisputed. As we drove from our house to the church and back, singing along to that tape. This pattern led to our family. This letter, this, this became a pattern in our family as we, whenever we would settle in for a drive to Los Angeles or, or Cedar City or wherever, we would have our favorite car bingo game ready to go and we would have a deck full of tapes and later CDs where we would listen to country music, musicals, and Garrison Keillor. And this has been a foundation of the way I approach and enjoy road trips with music as well. There are plenty other of examples in my life, and I'm sure we can all name a few, where people inspired us to take steps on our own by modeling theirs. We did not need to fill their shoes, but we're able to learn and grow, figuring out how to journey in our shoes along the way. Our scripture today is about filling some really big shoes. David is the man before he is a man. David comes to bring his brother's food from the field, and he witnesses Goliath taunting the entire Israelite army. The armies were on opposite sides of this field, and Goliath would come down every morning, it says, and he would stand in the middle, and he would shout up to the Israelite army, just taunting them. And here is an army, David notices, afraid to find one person who will take on Goliath in this challenge. Now, Goliath is a giant. He's physically imposing, verbally abusive, excuse me, and he's slandering the God of Israel. He says, come and fight me. Give me a champion. Rather than battle this out where we would have many die, let's just settle this one-on-one. If you win, then... I mean, if I win, excuse me, excuse me, Goliath sort of says this. He says, if I win, then we get the victory and the land and the spoils ours. If you win, well, let's just remember, I'm the biggest guy here, so just stand here and taunt you and insult you because you're never going to beat me. Just come on down and let's get it over with, Goliath says. David hears this, and he becomes the solution to a giant problem. David boldly goes up to Saul, the king at the time, and proclaims, no one else is going to fight, so have no fear. I will go and fight Goliath. The amazing thing is that after a little momentary protest by Saul, where Saul notes that David is just a boy, he goes, all right, go and fight him. (laughs) David is just this boy. He's new to this army standoff in the valley. He's not equipped from one looking on the outside to defeat this giant. And so he puts on some armor. He's outfitted in the proper fighting attire. And what happens is a very funny section of scripture. David is dressed in Saul's armor. The king who just told him, well, okay, you go and fight. This is nice of Saul to actually give him this armor, but with a bronze helmet, helmet, a coat, a mail, and a good sword, David can't walk around. It says he's trying to walk around. He can't even do that. The whole package is too big. He's he's not able or used to fighting and moving in this way. And this tells us, the reader, and reminds us that he's still a boy with plenty of learning and growing left. For the one who will eventually fit into the armor of a king, he is not in those shoes now. So David, with no experience outside of wild animals, is trying to fill the shoes of Saul, trying to be this champion over Goliath, And he is trying to figure this out. And rather than keep that armor on, though, he complicates matters a little bit. He takes off the armor, and he decides, I'm going to fight in the way I'm accustomed. I mean, so against this champion, Goliath, who has a shield bearer, someone just carrying his shield into this area, David enters with a staff 
five smooth stones and a slingshot. And we know what happens next. Goliath is incensed. A boy would come out and fight him. He taunts David. He taunts Israel. And he boasts about how this boy is out of his league. and He's going to be fed to the birds. Because this battle is for men, not for those playing in other people's shoes. David responds. What we did, did, what we kept, did you catch what he said in verse 47? David says, The Lord does not say by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now we may jump to the battle belongs to the Lord, and that is important. But David says, The Lord does not say by sword and and spear. The Lord saves in other ways. David knows he can't fill Saul's shoes. David knows he's not the warrior champion of Goliath. He's not what the Israelite army expects. David knows he's not wearing the proper clothing to fight. He has no experience in military strategy. But his strength, what God uses, is not in swords or spears. His confidence is not in armor or battle plans. His ability to step up against Goliath is due to faith in God because this battle, this moment, this action in time where David is participating is the Lord's already. He doesn't need to fill shoes or follow in Saul's footsteps. He does not need to be Saul. He does not need to be his brother's. He does not need to be the person even Samuel thinks he could or should or will be as we studied how he was anointed last week. All David needs to do is to fit in his own shoes and follow God. Now this seems easy, but we know it's hard to do. We begin to hear whispers as we grow up. Hopefully they're positive. Sometimes they say we're not following in our father's footsteps. We're not living up to our siblings who came before us because they have big shoes and we might not ever fill them. We may begin to feel what could be support for our steps in our own directions does not align with the expectations of others and we're forced to fall in line. And David was the youngest, tending the sheep. Next thing, he was being anointed king before his family His brothers, who were actually in the army there hearing those taunts, were not happy to see him. And they definitely were not happy when he ran off to to share his grand vision to the king. And David, probably as he walked out to battle, saw sideway glances of officers bewildered as he was the one heading off to meet Goliath. Maybe everyone was thinking, great, we're all going to die today. Saul could have just sort of sighed in resignation to defeat as this kid was the only brave soul to step forward. And we know in Scripture, Goliath was not amused by the ant coming in to fight him. Yet we are told time and time again, God does not look on the outside but knows the heart. God did not need us to, does not need us to be what others want us to be. God just wants us to be who we are already created to be. All of us in God's image with talents and skills and just be clear. And just to be clear, we don't need armor. We don't need tactics, a sword, spear. We don't need better degrees or more training, money, prestige. We do not need even to know all the right people to say the right things for God to win because God has already won. God's heart is for us to know that we are loved, that we are cared for. We are perfect now, just as we are. Now this past week, uh, on the Thursday the 17th, June 17th, which was a Thursday, I celebrated 20 years of ordination. And yet, this Sunday, which is Father's Day, was actually the day I was ordained. The Father's Day happened to be the 17th. So it's been 20 years I was ordained on Father's Day. I've always found a home in the church, and I've been blessed by that, actually, in many ways. But quickly, I'm going to just share some things. I was working my first summer camp at my, my first summer at camp when a friend and mentor took me aside and said I was doing a really good job. He mentioned a beloved cap, camp staff member who had died in a tragic car accident two summers before. He said, "You remind me of him." I idolized staff members uh, uh, at, tr- at, at camp, and one of them was a former youth leader. 
And I wanted to be just like him. And all of a sudden, I was a year behind him in seminary. I will never forget him dropping me off at my dorm after Sunday worship one day. And he told me, Alan, I'm glad we're colleagues and in ministry and friends in life. A seminary professor wrote on one of my papers, good job and unique thinking, which is not often necessarily a good job. But she, but she wrote, you have integrity, keep it up. A retired pastor in Carson City took me out for coffee one morning and told me that I have a gift which was puzzling because he was telling me I had a gift of apologizing. <laughs> Dean Strong cornered me after a gathering to tell me, stick with your guns. You may have felt like you lost, but be true to yourself. These, and I could name more, comments and situations I do remember fondly, not because I'm a great pastor. I remember them, and I keep notes that many of you have sent me because I doubt I get scared. I mean, I sit in the office of the great Reverend Dr. Mortimer Stocker. I walk into hospital rooms and have been confused by the staff as a grandson, even when I say I'm there as the pastor. I get angry in meetings when I cannot fathom the lack of empathy and love presented by leaders I look up to. And yet before I go off the rails, I remember, wait, you're a pastor. You can't get angry. Each one of us knows those nagging suspicions and subtle fears that creep into our minds and our lives and our professions and our vocations. That we may not be good enough, even with the right degree. We are not a capable leader, even though we are the boss. We struggle to find the right words in impossible situations. We question our worth because we make mistakes. We wonder if we're lovable because we took a step of vulnerability and no one responded. And in those moments, we look at the shoes we imagine we should fill and we might feel like we're lacking. And we forget those times when we've been encouraged because all we hear are the doubts and we're scared. The good news, though, is the battle belongs to the Lord. We are told in Philippians, Jesus did not equate being God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself on a cross. Jesus did not win salvation by a military victory. He did not become the savior of the world with sword and spear. Jesus points us back to our, lovingly, our, our loving heavenly father. Jesus gives glory to where praise goes to the creator. Jesus shows us that. Jesus did not turn away Peter for stumbling around and not getting it. Jesus actually did not turn away Judas from his table. Jesus did not call down angels from heaven to liberate Jerusalem from the Romans. Jesus walked his path. Jesus was faithful in his mission and his ministry. Jesus loved those on the outside, even when those on the inside made fun of him. Even when he was questioned, when he was doubted, and even when he was killed, when people walked away, Jesus continued to love. Now, he could have fit neatly into the shoes of a prophet or a priest, but he instead took the path that God had laid out for him. Jesus walked on that journey, and he calls us to walk our own as we follow him. We do not need to step directly into each step that Jesus made. We just need to follow. We do not need to have a special calling or even skills. We are just told, follow me. We do not need to wear armor or prepare for battle. Jesus has defeated death, not with sword and spear, but with God's light, truth, and grace. We do not need to earn salvation. All we need to do is accept that God loves us. Jesus is not asking us to fill his shoes. He points to our own shoes. And he said, those shoes are just as marvelous because they fit. They're unique. They let us move. They are special. Jesus says, just walk in those. Just follow me. David did. Giants died. We can too and see where Jesus leads us. Amen.
Friends, let's go from here. Let's go from here trusting in the path that Jesus has laid out for us. We have been blessed by people who have taught us and shared with us, who have guided us in our own paths and helped us take steps in faith. But remember, the shoes that we fill are just as big as the next person's. They're the shoes that God has given us. And God never, never fails with his creation. So let's go in the love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Be with us and guide us always. Amen. Amen. Amen.